Hello, everybody. I hope wherever in the world that you are that this webinar finds you healthy and safe. Thank you so much for joining the first uh, Healthy Seas webinar of 2021. Happy New Year. Um, today we're going to be unpacking marine protected areas and I am so privileged to be joined by three badass women who are at the top of their field when it comes to marine conservation. I'm Guillory Darabi. I'm an environmental filmmaker and journalist and a proud Healthy Seas Ambassador. I'm gonna be joined today by Dr. Julia Bernardi, Annie Mitropoulou, and Shannon Rake. I'm gonna have them each introduce themselves, tell me what they're passionate about, why they're here today, and what they want us to know about marine protected areas. Shannon, do you wanna go first? Sure, thank you so much. Uh, I'm super thrilled to be here. Thanks to Healthy Seas for having me. And um, my name is Shannon Rake. I am the Hope Spots Program Manager for Mission Blue. Um, and I work with all of our Hope Spot champions uh, all over the globe, which I'll get to talk about a little bit later. And I have a degree in environmental science. Um, and I love animals. I love the ocean. I love the environment. I have since I was uh, a little child. And uh, my goal is to do everything within my power and my capabilities and my talents to give a voice to the animals and protect their environment and our environment. Amazing. Julia. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining the Healthy Seas webinar. So uh, I work for, I'm a marine biologist too, so we are, I'm a colleague of Shannon, uh, and I, I live in the Olean Islands, a remote volcanic archipelago in Sicily, and I work for an English NGO called Blue Marine Foundation, uh, which is basically focused on three main issues. One is, the reason why I think today I'm here with you, is improving and enlarging existing MPA all over the world towards continuous constant awareness and educational projects by pushing the governments to reach the famous 30% of oceans protected worldwide. But also we encourage a lot the more sustainable small scale fishery models, which is my main uh, activity in the Olean Islands. I'll show you some pictures if I can, which are very particular. But also very important, I'm really strongly committed with local community to open the knowledge of marine life and local stakeholders for the young generations. So I would like to share you, if I can, just uh, a couple of slides. Hold on, just give me one second. It's not that one. Oh, do, 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 do. hold on. It's not that one. Okay. So this is a very simple slide where you can see uh, the the first pictures um, with all this this small spot is all activities of marine foundations worldwide. Then there is a small square. Uh, zoomed in the Mediterranean Sea and a small blue spot. There is where the Olean Islands are. So exactly in the center of the Mediterranean Sea. Then, um, I don't know how, I'd like to show, okay, that one, done. This one is a very, very nice picture. So I love to show because here we have really the protagonist of the main project where I'm involved in the last five years. Uh, the, the project is called Respons Responsible Fishery Model. And all these guys are Aeolian fishermen that work hand in hand with me and other biologists for the promotion of what we call a voluntary code of conduct for using very low impact fishing gear in harmony with either human needs, of course, but also with the natural cycles of fish stocks, which is very, very important. So on the top, you can see a very Nice guy with the long and white hair, which is a fisherman of Stromboli Island. I don't know if someone of you uh, listen about this island. So we have an active volcano that erupts continuously every day and every night. So also people that live in this island are very, very like unique. I would say unique. So this guy is, is organizing his daily fish catch in this small uh, wood boat. And then there is another guy 
uh, along the beach fixing his net. Then another picture with two fishermen working together. This is very nice because these are two fishermen working uh, together with a local school doing an artisanal fishing uh, course for local children. And then the other two ones, on, uh, one is for a fisherman of Salina, very proud of his uh, insulated fish box, which he has been donated by Blue for uh, improving the freshness of the fish catch. And the last one are these two guys again of Stromboli, very, very nice ones with long beer and white, showing bravely for the first time ever some sliced ice uh, in their island for the first time ever like since two years ago they never seen fresh eyes for their active their fishing activity so this is just for you know for showing you the protagonist of my with, with me in my life in the olden islands i love that thank you so much for sharing a slice of your world it's so nice to visually see like what part of the world you're fighting so hard for and what matters to you so what a wonderful introduction Annie, we'd love to know more about you. And one of the things that I love about you is that you're a mom and you're a stay-at-home mom and you've got your kids there in the background and they're part of the story as well. So we love hearing yeah. your little voices in the background. <laughs> Thanks. So hello from another mom uh, who apologize in advance in case my kids, you know, like come suddenly in the room. I hope they don't. Anyway, my name is Annie. I'm very glad being being here with you. Big thank you to Healthy Seas, first of all, for the invitation for this uh, amazing event. I'm very proud being among all these uh, beautiful ladies. I'm not a marine biologist, so please note that. I don't have the scientific, let's say, expertise that the other ladies of the room have, but I do share some knowledge from my background experience with NGOs working on the ground, and lately for the last three and a half years with the Cyclades Preservation Fund that I'm representing tonight as the executive director. The Cyclades, for the ones who don't know, which I don't believe there are any, is a fantastic archipelagos in the Greek scene, the Greek Aegean uh, archipelagos. So it's, let's say, a place where uh, it's a cluster of uh, 56 islands, 24 of them are uh, inhabited. So it's a big area. You all know the popular Mykonos or Santorini or Amorgos, all these fantastic areas. Um, all these places which have uh, very hard landscapes, but hide the real treasure, uh, treasure of biodiversity, I would say, including the marine biodiversity. So this is a place with thousands of rare species and also very uh, rich uh, marine uh, flora and fauna. We do have the privileged to have here important marine habitats such as the Posidonia seabeds or other reefs or the unique coral genus reefs and many, many uh, marine mammals like uh, dolphins and the very rare, uh, and I would say I think we have around the 25% of the world's population of uh, the popular monk seal, the Monachus Monachus, as well as uh, plenty of uh, sea turtles, careta, carenta, and many others. So there are many reasons why we should take a very close, a good eye for to take care of our seas. So just to focus on what we're doing, the Cyclades Preservation Fund, let's say, it's a member of a global, global um, network. It's a member of the Conservation Collective. This is a network uh, that supports funds like what we're doing, uh, like what we're doing. We are now, I think, 12 members. So what we're doing is supporting locals. And this is what uh, is similar with what Julia said before, because our knowledge actually, and our strength comes not only from the science and what, you know, like the marine biologists and the institutions and the um, research centers, or even the NGO says, but the knowledge we have is because of the locals, the people who live in the, in the sea, the fishermen, who know better than ourselves why marine protected areas are more important nowadays than ever. So because of our close relationship and, and partnership with the people on the ground, we can have and bring some knowledge to the discussion today. We are working with them closely in several projects that I will talk to you um, uh, later on. Thank you for this introduction.
Love it. Thank you so much, Annie. Uh, it's so brilliant to hear more about what you guys are passionate about and also about your communities because this really is a story about communities. Let's break it down a little bit and go back to the basics so that everybody can get on board. What is a marine protected area? How did this concept first come to be? And hmm. feel free to jump in, anybody who wants to share. So as far as concerns me, a marine protected area is what we really would like to have in the Olean Islands. So it's, so it's a good mix between human needs and marine preservation. And I think it's, it's absolutely urgent that this will improve all over the world. But maybe Annie can help us in, in telling us what really need, what, what really is a marine protected area because you have a marine protected area. I won't use, I guess, the scientific terminology, but the idea <laughs> is that um, all areas actually could be eligible to be declared as MPAs eh? if, if we uh, explore and understand uh, the treasure that they're hiding. But some of them have special resources to, you know, like to, de to declare them as such or to award them as such. So in the Cyclades, we do have now uh, a designated MPA, which is the island of Yaros. But I would need to say that uh, we're very proud having it after the long and hard efforts of people who have worked for many, many years and organizations such as WWF or MOM mm. who have worked for many, many years in order to do all the steps which are necessary uh, so that we have an area awarded as an MBA. And these steps, I would say, include to choose the area, of course, if, if I may just to say it in simple words, right? to understand in, in terms of environmental, social, and economical angles and aspects why this area is important. And here is always, of course, um, the science that will tell us, you know, with the environmental studies that will uh, prioritize because of the habitats, because of the species, why an area should be protected. And when we say protected, we mean we will restrict the human activities this will take different angles, stricter or less strict. We can say different, uh, we can find different zones, let's say, in a marine protected area where we uh, restrict more or less something. Then, of course, in order to create, as I said, there are many, many more steps which include the local st stakeholders and the decision makers, of course, the fishermen, the people who are more involved in the, in the area. And um, then we will need to create all these legal tools that will guide us into what country, each country has its own, let's say, uh, measures and, and steps in order to, to establish an MPA. But even if we create such an area, and if we say that we establish it, we cannot do anything if we don't have the management measures and the monitoring measures. So what we also need is a management body that if we want it to work effect effectively, it needs to be, to be working with the consultation and in a co-management, let's say, level of the local stakeholders. So we really need to understand, and I've said that, that it's not just a top-down approach. It's not just a decision that we will come by a ministry or uh, by the European Union to say, or globally to say that we need X amount of marine protected areas. The thing is how we will uh, become successful in order to get there, get, get there. And this is gonna be a long process, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that it will be a successful process, we need to make sure that it's not going to be only top down, but it will also combine a bottom up approach if I... Yeah, brilliant. Shannon, do you, do you know a little bit about, uh, about the history of marine protected areas? Like how did this model first come to be presented as a really effective tool? And are there really positive models around the world that you can point to that showcase this research? Yeah, absolutely. So um, marine protected areas kind of came about um, based on all of the work that's been done on the land. Uh, so we're all familiar with national parks or state parks or wildlife sanctuaries, depending on where you live. And marine protected areas are the exact same thing, but in the ocean. And so um, the science and research behind it has shown uh, that they are successful, that they're absolutely needed. You'll obviously always have people that don't agree, but uh, overall, the majority of the science does support and back it. 
And um, specifically speaking, um, we've seen it in, in many of our hope spots, um, you know, both where things have been designated at the governmental level, or um, there's something um, more like a, an MOU, sometimes in some smaller island nations, you'll literally have indigenous cultures that um, recognize that certain, you know, breeding or nesting areas need to be protected and allow the fish stocks and the biodiversity to grow and to reach maturity. And then obviously there's more fish for them to be able to, to feed their, their communities and families. And then specifically um, in Cabo Pomo in the Gulf of California, um, Hope Spot, uh, they, uh, it was decimated by overfishing and they created a marine protected area um, and it has rebounded immensely and the biodiversity and the fish stocks are abundant and it's now uh, an incredible um, destination for diving uh, and, and tourism, ecotourism. And, uh, and so that's, that's a success story uh, in and of itself. And those are the things that we're trying to replicate in all of our hope spots and in so many other areas um, over, across the world. Brilliant. Tell me mm. a little bit about this top down and bottom up approach. What does that mean? And what do you have the most experience with in your communities? Julia? Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, if we think about the top-down and bottom-up approach from a socioeconomic point of view, institution of marine protected area, a top-down approach is one where the environmental decision-making processes come from the upper levels, that is the government, which somewhat, somehow imposes the arrival of an MPA in an area of interest. On the contrary, the bottom the bottom-up uh, approach is the one where the low levels rise up and ask local policy to act for the changing. So as consequence, local policy must cover the role of like a spokesman of his territory and bring the message to regional or even national policy levels. From an ecological point of view, there are similarities like the top-down and the bottom-up, but of course the protagonists are different. Of course. Brilliant. Annie, what model do you think works best? What do you think is proving more successful? I guess we should mm. combine both. I mean, of course, it has to do with the culture of each country. In Greece, we do have, for example, two national marine parks, which are actually are the, the, the first MPAs in, in Greece. They both started, I think, in early 90s or something, or late 80s. One in Alonisos, mm. one in Zakynthos. So they, I would say that both are successful or effective, but they both take, uh, you know, like help from uh, other um, stakeholders in order to do so. In Alonisos, for example, there is a, a foundation, which is Thalassa Foundation, who is one of our strategic partners, who gives a lot of resources and knowledge, you know, like to the management body who is responsible to work the, marine, uh, the National Marine Park in, in Alonisos without their help. Uh, the park could not have patrols, could not have, you know, like rangers, could not have uh, the studies which are necessary to prove even to the local society why the marine protected area in their area is necessary. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it may have come as a top-down approach, but only with people who support the bottom-up approach, um, I would say allow the sustainability of a success uh, of a success story, but from our experience, from our experience, if you don't have um, the engagement of the locals, even if you have millions, uh, you know, like to spend or you know, like the best law, you cannot implement them. You really need to have the people on your side to understand that it's their benefit to have a, a protect a, a, an area protected. And to agree together the levels of protections, the regions, the zones, and also to see together the benefits mm -hmm. that one can have not only for the environment and the biodiversity, but also for tourism, but also for educational and research activities, but also for activities that has to do with the cultural heritage and the history of, of a place. So a marine protected area is much more than what it, its name says. It's not only about the environment. It includes, mm. you know, like the welfare of the whole community, of, of the whole local community. So an area, people who have an MPA in their neighborhood, they're very priv privileged people. This is at least what I can say. Yeah, that's really interesting. Oh. Something I'm deciphering yeah. 
the work you guys do is that it seems like you do a lot of convincing, whether you're convincing local fishing communities or, or governments, you have to really provide a lot of data and science and research and case studies to convince people that this is a good idea. Shannon, what are some of the challenges of that? How do you talk to government and how do you talk to local fishing communities? Uh, it varies. So all of our hope spots, um, I like to say, are on a unique journey uh, because they're all in different locations. They all have, uh, you know, different communities. They all have different um, ad government administrations that oversee them. And so there's really no cookie cutter approach. Um, everything has to be kind of, you know, tailored and, and adjusted to, to meet the community's needs. Um, but I would say, you know, the, the community essentially, we're, we're all for the community uh, based approach. Um, we call it, you know, it, some call it boots on the ground, we call it flippers in the water. Um, and essentially, you know, getting everybody to do whatever they can and get active in their local community. Um, and, mm -hmm. and now, just as uh, Annie and Julia said, you know, community effort and, and engagement, I think, is where most policies start. Right, and then it builds up, and then at the end of the day, you do need you do need the government support. You do need, um, you know, the stakeholders. Everything kind of has to come together in order to create mm. marine protected areas. And um, I just want to also say that something that we haven't quite touched on is, you know, there's a spectrum in marine protected areas. Um, so there's there's everything from something that's just um, what we call a paper park, meaning it's been designated, but there's not a lot going on there as far as management plan or enforcement, all the way up to the gold standard, which is highly fully protected, no take marine protected areas, which means there you cannot take and you cannot fish, you cannot extract gas, oil, uh, minerals, anything else, right? And then there's everything in between. And so it's really about finding the needs of the community uh, to determine what's gonna work best, uh, for everybody, but we at Mission Blue obviously uh, support and promote no take marine prote protected areas as much as possible. That's brilliant. Julia, I would think some of the most resistant communities would be the fishermen, fishermen, fisherwomen, fishers. Um, yeah. How do you get them on board and listen to their needs? Because if you're telling them they cannot fish in a certain region, that's their livelihood and that's their way of supporting their family. Tell me about that conversation. So it was quite hard, actually, and it is still an ongoing process because um, you have to work with the perception of people and to, to, and all to, and the same time to the urgency in doing that. So we have to find a way for speaking the same language between marine biologists, so conservationists, and local people, which sometimes, like fishermen, I love fishermen, I work with them for many since many years, but sometimes it's very hard to find a way of, uh, you know, a compromise. Of course, if you want to protect, I always, when, when I speak with fishermen, I always said, look, if you go into the field, into the land, and you have a field with tomatoes, okay, you know that you cannot take the green tomatoes because they are not good. So in the same way, you have to protect your sea. The sea is more difficult to understand, to perceive the urgency, because you, can, you can't see what is below the water. So there are many problems, troubling, troublings related to the absence of uh, seeing the problem, like the famous ghost fishing nets that LTCs came here in the Olean Islands. The, the fishermen that help us uh, together with the diving center realize that they made, they made a lot of damage, but they didn't see before. You know what I mean? So the perception is a crucial point for me for start um, working together with the local community, I must say. And, and the very important is also the involvement of local policy, which means local mayors, at least in the Olean Islands. So the perception of, the, um, of that we are at least in the point of no return must be uh, understood from fishermen, from local community, and from local policy. This is fundamental, otherwise we can't change. The revolutions, the revolution is possible when everyone is all together, you know what I mean? All people all together, otherwise single people, no revolution. Absolutely. I mean, I have to address the elephant in the room, it, the coronavirus. It's the reason we're not all sitting together and we're sitting at home. How do you have these difficult mm -hmm 
conversations with fishing communities during a global pandemic when everybody is so worried about their livelihoods, entire industries yeah. have been out. Yeah. Is it even is it even the right time to be talking about marine protected areas during COVID? Absolutely, yes. I mean, lockdowns have rapidly, we know everybody, have rapidly spread around the world with dramatic social and economic effects. Fine. I can't really reply for what happening inside MPAs because, again, we are waiting uh, since 1982 for an MPA in the but we still don't have, unfortunately. But I can speak for the small scale fishery sector, which faced many difficulties in the entire fish chain uh, from uh, harvesting to processing and marketing. Nonetheless, there have been some positive outcomes such as subsidized for the communities by the government during the fish ban. And consequently, there was an evident reduction of fishing pressure in some places. And what I saw around Italy, but I think everyone saw all over the world, is like it was a fast recovery of many natural systems, which maybe for the first time before, I don't know, I would say for global human development, released the human absence at sea. So finally, you know, a bit of silence and no catch. So humans were forced to take a step back which was fundamental to see the consequences of what we did in the last 50, 70 years. So nature went back to its origin and this was amazing. That's brilliant. Shannon, what's it like doing your job during COVID? Me, for me? Oh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm in California. So I'm unfortunately, you know, pretty much at home in my office. Um, haven't, we haven't been able to, we've been on a travel ban for over a year now, but I'm hoping that once the vaccine rolls out, we'll be able to get out there and travel. I know Dr. Earl is getting her vaccine now and she's eager, we're all eager to get back in the water. Um, you know, obviously, it, you know, it's a passion of ours and so we miss it tremendously. Um, but I, I also wanted to just say, uh, to touch on that last point that um, you know, for the most part, what we've encountered is artisanal fisher men and women um, realize that, you know, you have to protect certain areas and then it benefits them in the long term. Um, for the most part, artisanal fishermen and women aren't the ones that are dramatically reducing the fish stocks. It's the international commercial fishing fleets that come in with their mega ships and their, their huge nets, and they really just destroy the biodiversity in an area. And so those are, you know, I, it's not that we're just saying you can never fish, you know, to a fisherman, you can never fish ever again. It's, it's just protecting certain areas that are critical uh, to the fish stocks. And then also some of them, we can transition them into more sustainable um, jobs like ecotourism. Um, you know, they can become uh, snorkel and dive operators and, to, you know, ecotourist operators. Um, and it's, and it's in much of the time, it's more lucrative than, uh, than fishing. So. Well, I mean, one of the major industries to be wiped out during the coronavirus was tourism. Does that really put a, a nick in your, in your plans and your models when it comes to projecting future um, possibilities when it comes to ecotourism? Hmm. Well, I, I would like to say something relevant to that, which has to do with tourism, but I would, I would refer to that as an example of the way that we can build trust with the fishermen. Um, and this is one of the reasons and the way we work in the Cyclades, where we understand that, you know, trying to say to some professionals, stop doing what you're doing and you will have now a reduction in your income, but in some years from now, you will benefit. This is a nice story, but it's somehow difficult to, you know, like as we said before, to really um, make them understand that this will be true. So what we're trying to do is build trust uh, by uh, working with them in other less difficult, let's say, issues. That's why we decided in the Cyclades to work with the small scale fishermen in fishing tourism. And here it comes with tourism, as we said before, because for example, fishing tourism, is um, an opportunity for the fishermen without stopping what they're doing. We will, they will keep being professional fishermen and artisanal fishermen, but they will, be, they will open their boat and they will bring 
uh, some visitors on their boat. The visitors will benefit from the experience that we'll, we'll, they will see, you know, like experience the real sense of uh, traveling around the Cycladic Islands and, and see what is going on. And the fishermen will um, put less pressure in the fish stock because he, will don't, he won't need to fish as much as he would. He will fish less. He will demonstrate sustainable fishing. He will do, you know, like with the gears, um, the right gears, he will choose the right fish. So he will also train, let's say, the visitors in understanding the sea differently. And at the bottom line, at the, at the end of the day, he will benefit with the better income and, uh, you know, like understanding how valuable is the sea, not only for himself as a fisherman, but also for the other, uh, let's say, visitors. And at the same time, he will be very happy to see monk seals and sea turtles and dolphins around his boat that they used to be their enemies, let's say, since they are both, you know, like tackling the same fish. So what I wanted to say is that we can see the different thing from another angle. We can show this um uh, how how much sea matters for the for the for the people and the economy and their life and we can build trust uh, with these same people and they will be then ready to understand that when we are talking to them about the marine protected areas we are saying the truth and this way we can also um and we've done that too actually it was blue marine foundation in lime bay who had hosted some of our uh, fishermen to go there and see, you know, what the MPA looks like there, or we can bring some fishermen to the Aeolian Islands, you know, to see, to understand and to talk in the same language with the other fishermen. They don't need even to speak Italian, you know, they can speak with the body of the, with the body language and to understand what's the difference, because if they don't witness it on their own eyes, you know, it's difficult for them sometimes to envision what we describe them that the benefits we are. So tourism is again something that of course during COVID was difficult to, to deal with. But if we see tourism and ecotourism now as an opportunity to say a different story and a different narrative and to speak to the people and the visitors and the locals about the environment, we can make a big difference. That, that this is what I wanted to say. And I said it with uh, much more that <laughs> it should be shorter, sorry. Yeah, I can definitely see how tourism and ecotourism uh, would have been a, a very, you know, easy sell a year ago, over a year ago. But this past year has really changed the framework or how even how we become tourists. You know, we're a lot we're talking a lot more about being more sustainable tourists and how we can impact regions that we travel to. And, and when we are finally all vaccinated and can travel again, I think the, the mentality has changed massively. So this could be a great opportunity to marry those two concepts together. Let's talk a little bit about government. What have been some of the challenges in your region in communicating with governments and convincing them that this is uh, the best way to move forward. Julia? Sorry. So when we, I think that when we approach a new territory where there is no marine, prote marine protection, it is quite common to face with local skepticism and disinformation, fear. Uh, in general, I, I would say ignorance about these topics is very common. But I think the marine biologists or conservationists, naturalists have uh, the responsibility to fill this gap as much as, as much as possible. Even though being on the ground and maybe only know how, this, how hard it is uh, for raising awareness uh, day by day can be quite often a bit frustrating because it needs a lot of time and a lot of money to be invested before seeing like the first results. So, what can be really done? As uh, said before, I always say we must start from local community and then we can arrive to policy. So I would say again, school educational programs are fundamental because children can be a sort of amb ambassadors, uh, uncontested ambassadors of the ESC. Active involvement of fishermen again, yes, absolutely. In first line in, in all the decision making processes, local stakeholders in general and community but be part of the MPA revolution because marine protection is a revolution for a territory. And then local mayors, 
So local, regional, and national governments. So the mayors have to realize that the environment is, um, is a flywheel of development, not a, only a limit. Of course, we, as a conservationist, I must say that we, there will be some limits, but they will be uh, in very small areas, not in all over the area. And this will become an example in front of communities' eyes how we can use in a sustainable way and how we can do sustainable development towards best practices. So all this can, has to be started from local level and then we can arrive in my, in my case in Rome and speak with technicians in the Ministry of the Environment and say, hey, look, we are doing all this stuff. We are doing all these steps. Now we need you to be all these official, but it's very hard. It's very hard also because what I, I saw from my personal experience is that it's not only frustrating on the ground, but also sometimes when you speak with politicians is another language and they, they can say, you know what, if the, if the territory is not ready, we cannot say nothing, we cannot do nothing. But on the other side, I would like to say, uh, this is partially true, but it's partially wrong because you have the responsibility to do that. There are EU directives, international directives, convention that demonstrate that this must be done now. So of course the territory has to be involved, but you have the responsibility to create the ground to involve them in, on a revolution. So, but it's very hard. Something that uh, sometimes sways when it comes to politicians is having a very well-respected international organization like Mission Blue um, mm -hmm. declaring um, a wonderful part of the world a hope spot. Shannon, can you tell me about that? What kind of influence have you guys had and, and what does it even mean when something, an area is declared a hope spot? Yeah, so um, what happens is uh, a nominator comes to us um, Julia has been involved in the nomination for the Aeolian Islands and subsequent designation. And they have to fill out a nomination form, provide a, a lot of support, letters of support and information. And then it's reviewed by our scientific council. So it's, it's absolutely an area that uh, is deemed important uh, and necessary for protection. Um, and essentially what I tell people is, um, the little mighty Mission Blue um, with our, our kind of international reach and power, we give our champions a seat at the table that they otherwise might not be able to have, right? It's it's one thing when, you know, it's so hard for small NGOs and, you know, individuals to, to petition their government and, you know, uh, and to get heard, right? And so it, it helps having uh, a lot of public support and, and an international NGO uh, behind you, and that's exactly what we do at Mission Blue. That's incredible. Yeah, I also, uh, I also would like uh, to add uh, just a reflection about this for the Olean Islands. So the Olean's, like many uh, other remote uh, archipelagos in the world, uh, also I would say also some parts of Greece and Turkey, as far as concerns the Med, seems to live in a timeless space. Like everything seems quite similar. Like a hundred years ago, no? especially in the most remote islands, as, as the pictures I, I show you before, no? these uh, very old guys uh, fixing their nets in a very old plastic chair, like belonging to the father, you know what I mean? So therefore, every change is very difficult to accept. But at the same time, I think that international organizations that work for marine conservation, like Mission Blue, can give an international overview to local young people, at least, which are in connected each other all over the world, and which actually looks for a sort of sort of wide ranging and more holistic vision of what is happening in the rest of the world. So a hope spot can thus highlight the uniqueness of these islands, like many other islands, and the need of environmental policy and the duty to act now again. So you put a spotlight on these wonderful local projects and, and really, you know, spread the word to the rest of the world. Annie, I know you're having challenges with the area around Santorini. Would a hope spot or some kind of international attention help your cause? 
Well, that would be my next comment, actually. First of all, that we are jealous already. You know, I hope that the Cycladess will, you know, uh, be lucky enough to have a hope spot uh, soon with the help of Mission Blue. Well, yes, I don't want to be, um, I, I, or let, uh, let's say I will try to remain optimistic, but the truth is that we do have some negative stories to share. And actually, I can just say that as an observer, because there are so many other people who have worked actually uh, for the case of Santorini, including the Pierre-Yves Cousteau, you know, like the famous uh, mm -hmm. son, let's say, mm -hmm. who is, let's say, a, 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 a person a personality who has brought a lot of attention, uh, you know, to, to this case, which uh, despite the fact that so many local associations and uh, the mayor, the municipality, the local fishing association, you know, like NGO supporting, uh, so many people supporting the case, money spent, you know, like to create the studies necessary for the ministry, you know, like the people after years of efforts, they just keep uh, receiving negative uh, replies from the ministry. And here, you know, you really don't know what else to do other but keep putting pressure, you know, by using, you know, like as many, I don't know, like tools you can use and, and people and organizations uh, such as uh, Mission Blue. So it may be a very good point and idea uh, trying to have Santorini or other islands and areas, I mean, like um, in the Cyclades, who could be perfect candidates uh, for uh, such an award. I think that would uh, make sense. And uh, this also makes sense for uh, the politicians, I think. We, we should keep trying, putting pressure. Uh, it's, it's only, you know, like us, I mean, like the, the public who can make the change, you know. Uh, 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 sadly, at least in, in Greece, we see that there is always delay, you know, like in, in the law enforcement, you know, like there are uh, so many European directives that we wait for many years before they, you know, like become uh, uh, Greek laws. And even if we do have the laws, we saw so many years without their implementation. And even if they are implemented, sometimes they're implemented wrong. So uh, uh, we, we should keep watching, you know, all, the, all these things. I'm afraid that, you know, like the, the, the guardians of the seas are again, the citizens and, and the public, uh, along with the help of NGOs, big NGOs, we said before about Yaros. I mean, you should definitely ask the team of WWF who was working hardly for more than five or six years, you know, in order to make sure that they will have the designation of the area. And that would include so many uh, resources, right? Because you need to have the mm -hmm. team to do all this. It's, it's not something that a smaller team or mm -hmm. a smaller local NGO could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can feel the frustration with trying to convince government on all levels to get on board so that boots on the ground or flippers in the water model seems to be like a really viable and accessible way. Really start creating the change in your communities. Shannon, is that something that you really promote? Because I know you can't make everywhere in the world a hope spot. You've got to go through all your different criteria and every year you're focusing on a different region. But for all the parts of people who reach out to you in similar situations, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, obviously you, you have to, the people, the nominators have to have some experience, um, you know, some scientific connections. Um, it is, it is a, a process to, to, be, to be designated as a hope spot, but there's so much more that everybody can do, uh, less of even nominating a hope spot, like get, get involved with a local NGO, go participate uh, with Healthy Seas in ghost net removal and ocean and beach cleanups. Um, reduce your carbon footprint. I mean, that's the number, that's probably one of the number one things we can all do, right? So uh, think about how much energy you consume. Think about the products that you purchase. Are they made sustainably? Are they made from sustainable products? Are you using single use plastics? Can you eliminate those? Um, you know, we've, we've become a society of use once and throw away. And we really need to change our thinking and we need to get back to the way things were you know, 50 plus years ago where they made things to last and you use things for, for decades, right? And, um, and how you travel, you know, uh, what's your carbon footprint? Do you eat a plant-based diet? Uh, that's a significant, if you look at what your carbon footprint is when you're a vegan or a vegetarian versus uh, a meat eater, uh, it's, it's tremendous. Um, so those are all things that everybody can do in their own local areas um, and get involved no matter where you are, even if you're landlocked somewhere. 
Um, so I would, I would encourage everybody to do that. Everybody, you know, we didn't get into this mess on our, on our own. It took many, many decades and billions of people to get us into this mess. And it's going to take the same to get us out of it. And so everybody can do something as Dr. Sylvia Earl always says, use your talents. Not everybody's going to be a marine biologist. Not everybody's going to be an oceanographer. Um, but whatever your talents are, maybe you're an artist, maybe you'll be a, a teacher, maybe you'll, you know, um, who, who knows what you'll do, right? But there, you can all do something um, at some level. And that's what we're encouraging everybody to do. And then those that are gung ho and really want to push for change, certainly, you know, um, and are in it for the long term, because all of our Hope Spot champions are in it for decades to come. Um, it's not just a short term basis. But uh, yeah, for, you know, nominate a Hope Spot, um, you know, and, and we'll see, we'll see what we can get. Like I said, every Hope Spot's on a unique journey and some have no protection. Some are highly fully protected, no take marine protected areas. And we're trying to move the needle as much as we can uh, along that journey, along that path that they're on. And then obviously the ones that are currently protected, we wanna keep protected. So we've seen administrations come in, we've seen it here in the US, things can get reversed. Uh, now we're back on track. Uh, President Biden has committed to 30 by 30. Uh, along with, you know, over 60 other nations. So that's, you know, it, it takes, it's going to take everybody from the individual citizens all the way to presidents of countries. Tell me a little bit about 30 by 30. Is this something you guys are excited about? What is it and how can it impact the work that you're doing? Yeah, so yeah. 30 by 30 is, um, is basically a, a global call to action. Uh, we want to protect at least 30% of the ocean by 2030. Uh, I'm sure most people on this, this webinar know that the ocean produces the majority of uh, the oxygen that we need to breathe. And it also uh, sequesters a significant amount of carbon. And so we need to keep a healthy living ocean and we need to protect at least 30% by 2030. And we're currently at about 7%, but of that 7%, only about 2% is fully highly protected. So we have a long way to go. We're far behind uh, what we've done on land in, in national parks and wildlife sanctuaries on land. I think that's about 16% or so. So we're far behind um, in the ocean um, uh, protection, but we're, you know, like I said, Italy, um, thankfully, is, is on board. And so hopefully we'll be able to work towards creating an MPA in the Aeolian Islands and, and other places and um, about 60 other 60 other countries. So moving forward. Uh, really interesting. If I may, I just wanted to add two small examples that people can contribute, you know, like without doing uh, difficult things. One of them is one of the campaign that we're running that has to do with alien fishes, which is another big threat for our seas, you know, apart from overfishing or climate change or so in the Mediterranean, at least, and I'm sure that in, the, in Italy, you have also similar problem in Cyprus, in Italy, in Greece, we have, let's say, new visitors such as mm -hmm. the lion fishes, you know, who harm the local ecosystems here. So one of the things that we're doing is that we challenge, let's say, the uh, fishermen to choose these fish and not other endangered ones or try to make some of these fish, like the lionfish, which is edible, you know, like to make it a new, you know, like uh, talk of the town and, and bring it to the restaurants and to the chefs and create new receipts. So we also call the consumers, you know, like to make the right choice as consumers, you know, and this is a very easy way for people to protect the sea they love. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing I wanted to say that I just forgot. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, another thing was about Posidonia, another initiative that we are starting now in the Cyclades, which has to do with the uh, yacht owners, people who have boats and they travel. So people don't even know uh, how much damage the anchoring does to the Posidonia uh, seabed. And I know that in the Aeolian Islands, you have already uh, done a similar um, campaign, Julia, right? Yeah, right yes. There. Is right. So this is something that we will start too, because uh, we can protect our seas in so many different ways. So we really need to make sure that we don't leave, you know, the anchors destroying everything. So easy to do it right if 
we put in place the right tools to do it, campaigns, echo moorings, you know, like port authorities um, mm -hmm. designating the areas where a yacht should, you know, like uh, stop or not. Uh, so, I mean, there are so many things that we can do in parallel, of course, creating more and more and more marine reserves and marine protected areas and sanctuaries, but at the same time as businessmen, as, you know, like fishermen, as citizens, as consumers, there are so many different ways that we can do uh, protect our seas. Love that. Yeah. Are you guys up for hearing some questions from our audience? We've got a huge audience from around the world. I've been getting tons of hellos, hellos from Greece, hellos from Denver, hellos from all parts of the world. Hello to everybody. Thank you so much for joining in the conversation. And yes, we want to get to your questions. Annie, I'm going to kick off with a question for you. Um, in the case, and this is from Emma Kilbane. Emma would like to know, in the case of when all stakeholders are not on board, how do you get to some kind of conflict resolution? That to me, conflict resolution is probably a big part of all of your jobs. How do you get to an agreement, a compromise and get people on the same page? This is the story of our lives, I guess. You know, this is a usual scenario. You know, you never find consensus. So you always keep trying building that. And this is a lot, this is a lot to do with the reply I gave you earlier about building trust. There are, of course, people who, uh, you know, concern about what comes next. You really need to convince people that what comes next will be better than what we have now. And what we have now is, unfortunately, something very bad. So <laughs> it can only get better. Um, but at the same time, of course, we need to make sure that we will put some measures in place to support the people who, will, who may, you know, like suffer for a while before they see the benefits coming again. So conflict resolution is always a big challenge for NGOs and people you know, working on the ground. But I feel that uh, what we, at least what we're trying to do is working bilaterally at first and then bringing people on, this, on the same table, trying to find consensus on easy things of the agenda, you know, like, and then when we build trust, we get consensus in, in, in more difficult issues. This is, you know, I remember I studied that in the university. This is something that nobody has a, you know, like the, the solution, but depending on the culture of the people that we're working with, you're working with, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I would add also a um, uh, story about this. Uh, so we. As I, as I told you before, we are really in the beginning, the oil and island. So we are trying to create a common consensus with local people. And this is why we created just a month ago, uh, for the first time ever in the oil, in the oil and islands, a, commit, a, a local commitment organized in a MPA promoter for Salina Island, which is actually independent from the other six island of the, of the archipelago. So we have Salina with three mayors on it. And then we have six islands with one mayor. So we are trying to create a sort of a pilot island with Salina, creating this local movement. So as I said, Annie, it's very, very important to uh, put all local stakeholders around the table. But for me, very, very crucial is to try to safeguard the most vulnerable ones, so which are the marine operators. So diving center, fishermen, daily boats, uh, um, I don't know, marine biologists, of course, all around the table, because local communities should perceive that the MPA is not a li only a limit, but it's a, um, a, a revolution, is a, a motivation for going ahead, that, and the local people must be committed on this. And the marine biologists have to help them to do not feel uh, in menace. Okay, because the MPA is something that want to safeguard local community, local economy. So something that must be used, but just in a sustainable way. So this is fundamental when you have, uh, uh, that when you try to commit local people. Of course, never it will be possible to be altogether agree. We know this, but for having at least the majority of people on your side, you we should try to safeguard the ones that are more vulnerable, like fishermen and stuff like this. This is more important. Great. Harris would like to know, 
uh, something about the other elephant in the room, which is climate change. How can MPAs help when it comes to climate change mitigation and adaptation solutions? Is this something that's on your mind and on, on your plate? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, there's been some recent studies about how important living species are um, to carbon, the carbon cycle um, and whales and um, studies of uh, whale poop, if, if I can say that, um, and, and, and other uh, megafauna. And so, um, yeah, there's absolutely value in, in living systems. Um, and then, you know, the ocean, we look at the ocean, we see it's blue. Um, but there's actually billions and billions and billions of tiny, tiny little micro plankton and zooplankton. And that's the living ocean that Dr. Earl is always talking about. And that's without those things, there's no photosynthesis. They're not producing oxygen and absorbing carbon dioxide. Right. And so those that we have to have a living ocean and that directly ties into climate change. Uh, if, if we damage the living ocean uh, or continue to damage it, because we have, um, it's, it's going to make everything worse. Not only are you then producing less oxygen that we, every living thing needs uh, to, to breathe and, and survive, but you're also reducing the, the carbon uh, sequestering. So um, creating marine protected areas, protecting the species, uh, within those marine protected areas, even the microscopic ones that we don't see with our eyes, but are crucial to every breath that we take. Um, it's, it's incredibly important. Okay, I'm going to end with a question from Christian. And this is a really interesting way for me to get to know what your future vision is. Christian wants to know, given the amount of rejection that you guys receive, the amount of no's that you constantly get, what keeps you as an eco warrior getting up every day and doing what you do? And then I want you to follow up with telling me a little bit about what is your future vision? Why are you working so hard? When you think of world oceans and seas, like what's the kind of interaction between humans and our natural environment that you're really wanting to see and what keeps you getting up every morning? Hmm. That's Julia? a good question. That's a good question. So, um, well, I don't want to be passive. So I don't want to see things that are going ahead and doing nothing. And my personal vocation is, of course, related to the sea, but this is a very general environmental view, I guess. Uh, I think everyone, as Shannon said before, has to be active from, from its single uh, life. So uh, I, I also now I have a, I have a five month uh, daughter, so I really would like and I will do my best for her and for all the next generation to safeguard all the natural capital that we have, which is amazing. It's incredible. It's fantastic. So we have to work on perception of this at all levels. Try to do as much as we can to preserve it. So I think we are warriors, but everyone has to be a wire for, for, for itself because the world is belong to everyone. So it's a benefit that everyone has the right to use for his, for, for his life and for the life of the children, you know, and for the other families. So if you don't matter about the environments, why, why are you living for? I mean, it's, it's, it's why you breathe, breath. It's why you enjoy a natural daily trip. So we, 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 we must commit ourselves in doing that. Even though it's hard, it's very hard, but it's, it's, it's a way of life, you know. I love that we can hear your little one in the background because ultimately- I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She's- <laughs> Before. I think it's a great reminder, you know, like, why are we fighting so hard? And that little voice is a wonderful reminder for all of us. <laughs> Annie, what keeps you getting up every morning, keeps you motivated considering all the no's you get? And what's this future vision that you have? I mean, I really don't know, actually. This is my nature. This is our nature. I mean, I don't know how else I would do. I would dream. I would, you know, like uh, raise my kids if I would not fight, you know, like for a healthy environment. I mean, nature teaches us so much. My God. I mean, like, let's give something back and we will do it just because we are all selfish. We will not do it for the species, to be honest. We will not do it for the 
mangseals, we will not do it for the sea turtles, turtles or the birds or the elephants. Actually, we do it for ourselves, right? I mean, like, you know what I mean when I say it? I mean, like, it's, it's only a healthy environment that gives life to this planet. And if humans want to be part of this life, of this ecosystem, come on. I mean, let's do something else than just destroying this beautiful nature that was given to us for free. And our kids really, I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's like this, it's life. It needs to continue. And for us to breathe, for us to swim, for us to you know, have our mind you know, like clear and understand what we're doing and what we're doing, it, we really need to have a healthy environment. This is the least we can do to protect it. And I think, yes, your daughter or son, Julia, gave the right message in the right timing. That was exactly the message of, you know, like, keep doing it, mom, you're fantastic. I switched off the mic, sorry. She's desperate, I don't know why. Oh, all for the little ones. <clears throat> Shannon, you're up. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's my love, it's my passion. So that keeps me, me driven, but there are absolutely days where you get down and you just think, you know, what can, what can I, am, am I making a difference and what can I do? And then I talked to Dr. Sylvia Earl and I, you know, uh, put my pants on, button up my shirt and I get to work and I get back to work. She has dedicated her life to uh, protecting the ocean and the environment and the species that live within it. And, uh, you know, she's 85 years old now and still works more than full time. And um, I mean, you know, what, what a person to look up to. Um, so she obviously keeps me motivated and focused, but the animals do, you know, the environment does. I don't want to live on an earth and I don't want future generations to live on an earth that's barren and looks like Mars. Um, you know, I love nature. I love the environment. Uh, we are part of, of the environment, you know, all things are connected and uh, we need earth to survive. It doesn't need us. And, you know, we can choose to be a symbiotic virus where we can live, you know, in symbiosis with, with nature and uh, it can be a positive uh, for both, or we can be a virus that kills its host and ultimately kills ourselves in the process. And so we all have that choice to make and those choices we make on a day-to-day -day basis, as I spoke of earlier. And, uh, and, and don't let the news get you down you know, just, you, we have to push forward. We have to stay on it. There is no other option. As Dr. Earl says, uh, no blue, no green, no ocean, no us. Brilliant. It, this has been such an invigorating, inspiring, and just energizing conversation. I want to thank each of our guests so sincerely for making the time to connect with each other, to connect with me, to all of the people around the world who tuned in. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. We've been getting some amazing comments and questions. Come back for our next uh, webinar. We're going to keep these going on. And ultimately, I think a big thank you from all of us to Healthy Seas. Um, without them, we wouldn't have all come together. They created the space. They created the platform, the conversation. So check out healthyseas.org if you want to get involved an amazing group of volunteer divers who go around our beautiful planet cleaning it up, removing ghost gear and abandoned fishing nets and using that raw material, that garbage that some people consider it to be and turn it into beautiful things. So let's all get on board and um, do the best we can. I hope uh, you guys stay healthy and I hope your kids are okay. I hope that they're not too <laughs> angry with mom within, okay. you know, <laughs> an hour. And I thank you all for Pleasure, time. ladies. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you too. You were you were fantastic moderator. Thank you for your time and enjoy sea life forever and ever. We will be waiting for you to the Cicla de Se and uh, yes. all the islands, yes. of course. <laughs> Bring it come summer soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye, you. Bye, bye, thank bye. you. Healthy seas. Bye.